Good morning, Willoughburn. I'm here to do the message. Even though I hate the message, it reminds me of the message, the book that scares me. But anyway, um, we won't go there. Um, I'm picking up John chapter 20, right where Adrian left off two weeks ago. So if you want to find John chapter 20 in your Bible or device, that would be cool. Um, gonna, oh, thank you, sir. Going to quickly pray while you get there, and then we'll get right into it. So, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done in creating us as people, in giving us a place in your world, and then uh, in doing the ultimate in sending your son to die for us. Jesus, thank you so much for what you did on the cross all those years ago, and thank you for being here with us today through your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, open our minds and hearts, help us to receive what you have, and help me to be nothing but the vessel of God, so that all the rubbish I'd like to say doesn't come out, and all the things you'd like to say do come out. Please be with us all today. Amen. Okay, so I'm well known for talking too fast, and when I uh, uh, did my practice run this morning, this took me 28 minutes, so I might try and slow it down a bit, Uh, we'll see how we go, but hopefully it won't be a too long um, sermon. So John chapter 20, I was, um, so I'm looking at the second half of the chapter where Jesus makes some surprise visits to his friends and disciples after his resurrection. I did consider calling this sermon the post-mortem appearances, but I decided that gives the wrong idea because post-mortem gives the connotation that the person is still dead. And Jesus was very much alive when this happened and still is today. So I've stuck with the suggested title of Surprise Visits. Okay, let's get into John chapter 20. This is straight after Jesus appeared in the garden to Mary Magdalene, so picking up right after um, Adrian's sermon. In verse 19, we'll start. So... Verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. And said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Slightly different to our memory version, because this one says Messiah instead of Christ and doesn't have the word miraculous. But that's okay. It means the same thing. So that's the passage. Um, I found out I was preaching this several weeks ago and I got an extra week because I got shuffled so that we could hear Alex last week. Was it Alex? I think it was Alex. Cool. Not good with names. Anyway, so that was fantastic, listening to him, and it was good to have an extra week to prepare because, honestly, I really struggled to get much out of this passage. There was... Every time I read it, I just had a whole stack of questions with no answers. Questions like, how long is it between when Jesus rose from the dead and when he appears to the disciples... Uh, what does he do for the rest of the time, the other 40 days before he goes back to, um, back to heaven? Um, why are these particular instances recorded and not others, if he appeared to other people that we're not told about? Um, how many appearances did he make in total? Why did he choose to appear in the way that he did? Yeah, lots of questions. So I've been doing a whole bunch of research, and I found that uh, my first question, which is how many... Um, appearances of Jesus were there. Um, there's actually 10 recorded. Is this working? Uh, yes, good. So I know you can't read that because the writing's tiny, 
Sorry about that. Um, I couldn't make it any bigger and still fit the whole thing on the screen. There's 10, whoops, um, 10 instances recorded in the New Testament um, of Jesus appearing or surprise visiting um, his friends and disciples between the time that he uh, was resurrected and the time that he ascended back to heaven. There's actually 11 in total if you count the time where he appears to Paul on the road to Damascus. But we're looking today at two of the ones that happened um, in the early period. So as you can see there, there's actually five of them um, that appeared, uh, that happened, these three and these two, all happened on Easter Sunday itself, the day he was uh, raised from the dead. Then eight days later, he meets with them again, and Thomas was there this time. We've just read about that. Later, he meets with seven disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, uh, disciples in a large gathering, and so on. So if you're really interested in researching those, that's going to be up there for a while, so you can grab the references and go have a look later yourself. Okay. So five of them happened on Resurrection Sunday. The other five happened over the following 40 days. Um, this little timeline is from Answers in Genesis, Creation Ministries International. So if you want to go have a look at the article that goes with it, the reference is there at the bottom of the screen. Can't read, that's fine. <laughs> um, so Adrian already walked us through the first appearance to Mary Magdalene, and later in the same day he appears to some other women, uh, Salome, Joanna, and at least one other. Um, but the finale of Resurrection Sunday, the last surprise visit on that day, is recorded right here in John chapter 20. So I just want to look at it again, verses 19 to 23. Follow me along. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. After he'd said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Slow down. So there is quite a bit going on here. What are some things that you notice from that little part of the passage, just the verses 19 to 23? Shout them out. You know I love interactions, so tell me what you notice. The doors are locked, but Jesus still pops up. Yeah, just, you know, a locked door is no problem for the resurrected king of the ages. Who else? What else do you see in there? The yep, they're absolutely terrified. And Jesus says, no, it's cool. I'm alive. Don't worry about it. Um, anyone else? Anything else that stands out to you? Yes. Gives them a lot of authority there, doesn't he? You forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven, and if you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. That's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, breathing on them. Why the heck did he breathe on them? That's cool. So, yeah, there is quite a bit going on there, and those are some of the things that really stand out to me and raise more questions. But one of my earlier questions is answered. We know right off what day it is on that the evening of that first day of the week. So we're still talking about Resurrection Sunday, the day that Jesus rose. Think about it. For the disciples, it's been a long day. It started in the morning with some women coming and saying, he's risen, he's risen, the tomb's empty. You know, all through the day, Peter and John have run down to the tomb and seen it empty. Um, some people um, are on the road to Emmaus and Jesus appears to them. There's all these rumours going around. He's alive, he's alive. And then the Jewish leaders are like, oh no, what do we do? Quick, spread another rumour that the disciples stole the body. So it's been a long day, and they're all like, what's true, what's not? Don't know. They've come together at the end of the day somewhere. We don't know exactly where, but it's a house in Jerusalem. And they've locked the doors. They've gathered together in hiding. They're afraid. So it says they had locked the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Could it be true that he's alive? Could it not? All these different accounts going around. Who's seen him? Who hasn't? Who can we trust? There's a lie going around that we stole the body. Let's all just kind of lay low for a bit see what happens. Put yourself there. You're a disciple. You guys in this room, you're all scattered around this probably fairly small room. Um, they're hiding. They're behind locked doors. You try not to make any noise. Try not to give away your location. Beaten, confused, discouraged, and afraid. And then King Jesus just steps out of thin air. Boom. I don't think there was a flash of light or a big boom of thunder or anything else. I think he just sort of stepped out of thin air and was there like... Peace be with you guys. <laughs> Chill out, it's okay, I'm back. <laughs> so I've tried over and over to imagine this scene, so permit me a little flight of the imagination. As I said, we're all disciples, we're scattered around. Some of you are whispering about the rumours. 
probably Adrian's having a whisper about that. He's heard this and someone else has heard that. A few of you are lying on the floor, just passed out from the exhaustion and grief of the day. I'm like, what's true? What's... Yeah, Camille's passed out on the floor. Cool. Um, the, the door's locked and James and John, let's substitute uh, Sarge and Ben, are sitting with their backs against it should anyone try to break in. Simon the Zealot is beside the window, stroking his sword and watching the street. And that's got to be Denj Valderrama. Uh, <laughs> and no one knows where Thomas is. No one knows where this guy's gone. And Peter's sitting in a dark corner with his head in his hands. Everyone's afraid and confused. You're all exhausted. And suddenly, Jesus is there. How would you respond? Imagine if Jesus just stepped out of thin air right here in Willowburn. What would you do? I'd probably just sit down and let my mouth hit the floor. But that's cool. You might respond something differently. Um, I've tried to picture this scene over and over throughout my life because it's just so amazing. Like, they've just seen Jesus die. They've heard all these rumors. Some of them have seen an empty tomb. Some haven't. But then he's just there. So I always come back to a Don Francisco song that I heard as a child. And I'll read you some of the lines from that as they're telling the story of how this happened from Peter's perspective. So, again, it's a flight of the imagination. But... uh, It sort of gives you a poignant picture. It says, uh, Back inside the house again, the guilt and anguish came. Everything I'd promised him just added to my shame. And when at last it came to choices, I'd denied that I even knew his name. Even if he was alive again, it wouldn't be the same. But suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. Light that came from everywhere drove the shadows from the room. Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. I fell down on my knees. I just clung to him and cried. But he raised me to my feet. And as I looked into his eyes, love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. All my guilt and confusion disappeared in a sweet release as every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace. He's alive. He's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive. Wow. For me, talk about a surprise visit. Talk about blowing away their doubts and fears. The last thing they would have expected is for him to just step out of the air in front of them and say, peace be with you. So here I am, guys. I'm alive again. Come and touch me. Feel the wounds. Leave no doubt in your mind. John describes their reactions rather simply when he says, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I mean, couldn't you have put a bit more of the reaction in there? Like, this was an amazing event, a one-time thing. So he says the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord, and I'm wrestling with that, going, why didn't they have a bit more of, oh, I could really gel with this story. And then I thought, wait a minute, this is a model for my reaction, for our reaction as Christians. This is how our reaction should be whenever we encounter Jesus, at work, at church, at home, at school, wherever we see him reveal himself in creation, in our conscience, even on the soccer field when you see a beautiful play and passes work and you get a goal. It's like, that's just, that's the kind of synergy you should see in the church. You should be overjoyed when you see the Lord. So Jesus says again, peace be with you. And then he mobilizes them for ministry. This is one of the greatest turnarounds in the history of the world. This confused, fearful band of disciples rises up and takes the world by storm with the message of life and love. Jesus commissions them right here. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Ben picked up on the breathing on them before. What do you think is going on there? Why does he breathe on them? Give me some thoughts. No wrong answers. Seems fairly literal. Um, He breathed on them and then said, receive the Holy Spirit. So... There's nothing in there suggests that he didn't actually breathe in their faces. So, why do you think he did that? Very particular purpose. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Immediately he says, "Receive the Holy Spirit." Yep. That's cool. Um, Does anyone remember another time when God breathed onto a man? Way back at the start, in Genesis, if you have a look back in Genesis 2, verse 7, 
It says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that man became a living being. God's breath gives life, it gives power, it gives his spirit. That was the first beginning for mankind. And here, all these years later, Jesus breathing onto his disciples is a new beginning. It's literally God breathing his spirit onto them. And if it brought life to a pile of dust in the first place, imagine what it can do giving the Holy Spirit to these already functional human beings that have been walking with Jesus. Also remember in Acts 2 verse 2, later on, when they receive the Holy Spirit um, as tongues of fire and stuff, it says they hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. If you put the two together, I love the imagery there. First, way back at the beginning, God breathes into a pile of dust and it becomes a living man. Here, God in the flesh breathes into living people before him, his disciples, and says, receive the Holy Spirit. That breath of Jesus builds and grows and becomes a mighty rushing wind that goes on, gives his um, disciples the Holy Spirit. It becomes a mighty wind that blows across the world, down through the ages, calling people to himself. It's still blowing today. Each of us here are only here because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And because those first people that received it were faithful. So Jesus confirms the authority and power he's just given to the disciples through the breathing and giving them the Holy Spirit with his next statement. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. As I said before, that's a lot of responsibility, giving human beings the power to say your sins are forgiven or they're not. Remember earlier in, um, in John, Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees. Well, not only been John, but somewhere in the Gospels, he's challenged by the Pharisees saying, only God can forgive sins. How dare you forgive sins? And he's just said, you guys have the authority to forgive sins in my name. I think that's real cool. Like he was literally giving them the power to be his ambassadors to the world. So, John cuts to black and the scene ends. That's it. I've turned up, I've said peace be with you, given you the Holy Spirit, and that's it. We move on into the chapter. Next question. Come on, work, you slow thing. Where was Thomas? What are your ideas for, for that one? And there are no right or wrong answers because the Bible literally doesn't say. So what do you think? What was he doing? Why wasn't he there? Having a kip somewhere? Gone out to buy dinner? Having some alone time? <laughs> Maybe got the directions wrong to the hideout? <laughs> Maybe he's, you know, he's a bit jealous of all these people that Jesus has appeared to and he's gone to have a look at the tomb for himself under the cover of dark? Who knows? We're not told. John simply says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. Like, duh, he just stepped out of thin air. Yes, we've seen the Lord. <laughs> Can you imagine, again, Jesus rocked up here, stepped out of thin air at Willowburn and said, oh, you all peace be with you, receive my spirit, blew in your face and then popped out again. What would you tell your friends that weren't here this morning? <laughs> You won't believe this. <laughs> Adrian would have his iPhone out. Oh, I've got to get this one. It's going to make a perfect sermon illustration. <laughs> I, I would probably say a bit more than we have seen the Lord. <laughs> Just saying. But it encapsulates how they felt. We've seen him. That's all it needed. But wow, man, it was the most amazing thing ever. I would go on and on about it if Jesus rocked up here at Willowburn. And I'd tell everyone else that I knew there was a Christian, you really missed out. You should have been there. It was cool. But they told him. And then our dear Thomas spouts the famous line that earned him the nickname Doubting Thomas for all of history. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Bit of an agnostic. Uh, personally, I think Thomas gets a bit of a bad rap for this statement. I mean, one statement doesn't encapsulate all of who you are. <laughs> Does it? There's a lot of things I don't want to be caught out for that I've said. <laughs> but yeah, if one statement encapsulates all that you are, and that's all that's recorded of you, it can be pretty damning if it's something as bad as this. Why didn't he believe them? These are his mates. He'd been with them the last three years. Why would he not believe all ten of them together saying, yeah, look, Jesus was here. You missed out, but man, he was here. It seems a little arrogant that he would say, I won't believe it unless I see it for myself. What else do we know of Thomas? Anyone got any ideas? He's the one that encourages him to go. There's a festival when everyone else is saying no. So. 
Good pickup. Good pickup. Yes. Anyone else? Called the twin. Someone's done his homework. Yeah, we don't know a lot about Thomas. Uh, what we do know, we can establish from the other Gospels, is, as Steve said, his name means the twin. Literally, Thomas means the twin. And Didymus also means the twin, because it's just a Greek interpretation of the Aramaic Thomas. So, the twin, which means the twin. No one knows who his twin was, or if he even had a twin. Some have suggested that he looked similar to Jesus, and therefore he was given the nickname the twin, because he looked like Jesus. I don't know, that's neither here nor there. Um, doesn't really mean anything. But uh, he was one of Jesus' first disciples. He was in the first group of recruits that came and followed him. Um, and as Adrian mentioned, he has another one-liner, which is not as famous, and he's certainly not known as Thomas the Willing or you know, Thomas the Brave. <laughs> but both of those things are a part of his personality, as revealed in this other one-liner. So if you want to go back in um, John a little bit for me, go back to John 11, where we got our fantastic sermon about heat death from... Ben, when Lazarus was dead and being resurrected. So you go back to John chapter 11 and have a look at verse 11. We'll start there. I think it's verse 11 when we start, after he'd said this. Is that how verse 11 starts? Yeah. Cool, all right. Awesome. So after he'd said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciple replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. And Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, the twin, the twin, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> the last time they were in Jerusalem, they got chased out of there and Jesus' life was threatened and it was pretty bad. So they bailed and you wouldn't want to go straight back. But this is literally going straight back to Bethany, which is very close to Jerusalem, putting themselves back in harm's way. So Thomas, logical, rational fellow that he is, says, oh, we're going to die. Well, let's go, guys. We better be with him when he dies. So that reveals something of his character. He gets up and says to the other guys, well, let's not let him go alone. Let's go with him so we can die with him. That's brave. That's a man of conviction. That's a man willing to die for someone he believes in. He believed in Jesus. But then he watched Jesus die on that cross. So at this point, when they're going to see Lazarus, Thomas has accepted, we're probably going to die. I'll be happy to die with Jesus. And he's telling the others, let's go, let's go, come on, get up, don't be scared. I actually identify with uh, Thomas more than any of the other disciples because he's a little bit of an agnostic. He wants to see the proof for himself. But uh, once, sorry if this sounds like tooting my own horn, once convinced he is a man who takes action, and he, his faith won't be shaken. So hopefully I can measure up to that. Um, but in particular, his rationalisation, I need to see the proof for myself. That's exactly how I ended up coming to Christ. I grew up in a Christian family, so I sort of believed in God as a kid, but only because that was what was cool. Everybody did. Once I became a teenager, I walked away from God big time, didn't want to borrow him, and it took a personal tragedy where one of my best friends was killed in a car crash before I started trying to find out you know, whether or not God actually existed and if he had anything to say for himself. He did, and I slowly but surely got my mouth shut and convinced that not only was God real, but Jesus was both a historical figure and God himself, and he was the only rational, logical choice for a person to believe in, because everything else doesn't make any sense. There was overwhelming proof that convinced me, and that's what Thomas is asking for. Translate what he says, his doubting Thomas statement, into modern language... And he basically just says, unless I see it for myself, I won't believe. Unless I can see the evidence and touch it and feel it and taste it, I won't believe it. You ever heard anyone say that? I bet you have. I hear it all the time at uni. Uni students love to say that. They think it makes them feel... I think they think it makes them appear to be intelligent and have some critical thinking. I'm not just going to believe whatever hogwash I hear. Unless I see it for myself... So that's exactly what Thomas does. Okay. Did God need to, sorry, did Jesus need to appear to Thomas the second time? Later on we see that he actually appears to them a second time in this chapter and Thomas is there. Did he need to do that? No. 
The short answer is he didn't need to worry about Thomas. He could have just let him go. He could have worked with the other disciples that had been there and had seen him. He said, oh, tough. You didn't make it to the party. Where were you? You sod. And left him behind. But that is not the nature of our king. That is not the nature of King Jesus. This is where, again, we see the loving, searching, pursuing nature of God. We've seen it right through John. And we see it here again, almost at the end of the story. King Jesus wants to love everyone. He wants everyone to choose him. And I actually believe that, I mean, he's already died to save these disciples. Of course he would pursue Thomas and show him the proof. That's who he is. So John doesn't even tell us how Jesus knew that Thomas was doubting. If you read there, have a look. Does it say anything about someone going to Jesus and telling him, oh, Thomas wasn't there, you know? (laughs) He doesn't believe it. He didn't believe us. You better toss him out with Judas. No. We don't know how Jesus knows, but he knew exactly what Thomas had said when he comes to him. He said, put your hand, put your finger in my hand, put your hand in my side, stop doubting. I think Jesus just knew. I think he knew his followers well. I think he knew Thomas wasn't there the first time. He actually missed him when all the other 10 were there. And he knew what it would take for Thomas to believe. He also knew that Thomas was a man worth convincing. He'd seen him be willing to die for him before. He knew Thomas would be willing to go to the ends of the earth and to die for him if he could be convinced of the truth that Jesus was actually alive. And so he met him where he was. He gave him exactly what he needed to believe, to the word for word. It's like, you said you needed to do this? Here I am. Touch me. Stick your hand in that hole where they stuck a spear in me. Stop doubting. So just read it again there. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas's response, my Lord and my God. That's a pretty cool response. Like he doesn't say, oh, yep, cool, I got it. Yep, oh, I'm sorry I wasn't here before. Oh, I think I'll go do penance now. No, just my Lord and my God. Total acceptance, total commitment straight away. He was convinced. And Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet have believed. And there's heaps of interpretations of that particular statement. Some people say that uh, that's just for everyone that came after the disciples that didn't get to see Jesus but yet believed, so including us at the end of this day. I think it was also for some other disciples that weren't actually there that he didn't appear to. But the whole point of that is I think that Thomas needed to see to believe and Jesus was willing to meet him where he was at, what he needed to see. And I think that's the nature of King Jesus. Adrian likes to say that Jesus is coming for us like a superhero. It's true. Jesus is coming for us. He's never stopped coming for us. He reaches across time and space to touch the lives of every individual today and gives them exactly what they need to believe. Another part of the Bible says that no man is without excuse because God has made himself visible through creation, through our conscience, through Jesus coming. No one is without excuse before God. He makes sure everyone gets a chance to believe. And he gives them exactly what they need to believe. But not all of them will. Some will miss his coming altogether. Some will hear about it and will doubt. Some will see him and continue to doubt. Some will demand proof. Some of them will find it. I found the proof I needed. God made that available to me. I wouldn't have believed it just because mum and dad did. Some will not believe. But some will. Some will not hear or see and will still believe. Some will hear and some will believe, and some will declare him my Lord and my God. This is the practical outworking of this for me. God invites us to seek those lost sheep with him, just as he told the disciples, as I have been sent, so I'm sending you. Never took that back. That's passed on down to every single Christian. He invites us to seek those lost sheep with him. They're out there. Look around. I know we do this a bit, but this church isn't full. There's a lot of empty seats. Heaven isn't full. The gates are open wide. There's plenty of room. King Jesus is coming back. We'll be overjoyed when we see the Lord, right? Just like the disciples were? Heck yeah. But how much greater will your joy be if you can bring a whole bunch with you? John closes the chapter with our memory verse. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So he does a couple of things here. He gives us the purpose of writing his gospel in the first place. 
I've written everything down so that you may believe. Um, this is why he chose the seven particular miracles that he chose that we've looked at already. This is why he wrote about the particular interactions between Jesus and the disciples that he did. There are plenty of others that the other guys record, Matthew, Mark and Luke. John chose these particular ones to show that Jesus is the Christ, that we would believe in him and that by believing we might have life in his name. Even right down to this interaction with Thomas and showing that Jesus was willing to go to where Thomas needed him. He was willing to show Thomas exactly what he needed to believe. That's the nature of Jesus. He'll never stop pursuing us and giving us what we need to believe. The other thing I like about this statement is the way John uses the word you here. Written that you may believe. That could be a collective you to the people that would have immediately read his gospel. It could be a collective you to all of the church that ever reads it. Or it could be a very personal you. These are written that you, Daniel, may believe. These are written that you, Gabby, may believe. These are written that you, Stephen, may believe. These are written that you, Edward, may believe. It's a personal you. So read the Gospel of John, study it, allow God's Spirit to convince you it is true, because by believing it's true, and believing in the Son of God, you can have life in His name. I'm finished, I'm going to pray, and then we'll get Sarge back up here. King Jesus, it's fantastic the way that you can break all the boundaries. Lock doors, no problem. Step out of thin air, yep, done that. Walked on water, been there too. It's amazing that you have total control over your entire creation. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense logically, but it's hard for us to believe. Thank you that in this account with Thomas that you showed us that you are willing to go to where we're at and willing to convince us that you are real, that you are alive, and that you're there for us. Thank you that you just keep coming. Um, no matter how much we run away or pull away or just um, try to hide in a corner, if we're just not there when you show up, you keep coming and you should give us exactly what we need to believe. Help us to live out that to others as well. Help us to think of those people that just don't love you, they don't know you, and they keep choosing not to. And help us to keep doing what you do. Keep going for them. Keep coming for them. Help us to draw them close to yourself so that truly when you come again for us, there's others alongside us that will be overjoyed when they see the Lord. Be with us today as we finish our worship service. Amen.